Hey guys, welcome back. So today is going to be hopefully a very simple video. It's going to be on just phenytoin. I thought I'd just stick to phenytoin for now because there's quite a bit of information to know about it. So hopefully it will be very informative. Just a quick thing before I start as well, and I think it's a good idea for me to talk about it, is in regards to the exam that you guys were supposed to start taking as pre-reg student. It sucks. It actually sucks. I can't even begin to imagine how irritating it must be knowing that it's being pushed further towards either the end of this year I think it said or the beginning of next year but genuinely guys please 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 don't give up don't give up this has literally maybe probably been a blessing in disguise you guys need to continue to work hard honestly and don't push yourselves too hard take it day by day just don't don't lose the motivation because as soon as you lose the motivation that's it you're done you're not going to want to study anymore even if you guys learn one thing from this video that means that's fine y you're continuing to study just don't give up hope you're all in this together we're all in this together so let's get right into phenytoin so phenytoin that is going to be in your anti-epileptic chapter and it's one of the high risk medications that you guys need to know about so the first thing that we're going to be talking about is its range that you need to remember which is 10 to 20 milligrams per liter in exam questions they'll ask you what is the range and you're going to need to know it off by heart and you've got different ranges for example for carbamazepine you've got it for theophylline you need to distinguish between all of them I've seen in an exam paper before where they've asked you for the range and they've given you something like 10 to 20 milligram per litre and they've given you something between 15 to 20 milligram per litre. Preferably, we want the range to actually be in the higher, higher range in, in regards to being 15 to 20 milligram per litre. But generally, the thing to stick with is 10 to 20 milligrams per litre. Now, another thing to know about phenytoin is that it's actually an antifolate. So you've got other drugs that are antifolates. You guys will probably know this. You've got your methotrexate, you have got your trimethoprim. And remember, we don't want to give a patient multiple medications that are antifolates because it can lead to blood dyscrasias. Um, it will start messing up with your white cell count and also your red blood cells and can lead to things like megoblastic anemia. Now, in regards to monitoring plasma levels, Phenytoin ends up generating a non-linear relationship between the dose that you give the patient and then the result of the plasma concentration. What I mean by that is for every time you increase the phenytoin dose for a patient, you might increase it by maybe 50 milligrams. That might not necessarily be a huge jump, but in regards to the effect that it's going to have on the plasma concentration, it can be a really, really big difference. For every small change can lead to a huge change in the plasma concentration, which you need to be aware of when you're in when you're gradually increasing the dose for a patient on phenytoin. Also, phenytoin is a highly protein brown brown, um, highly protein bound medication. Oh, I lost thought. Medication meaning it binds to albumin. Now there are specific categories of patients where the albumin level and the protein level decreases those patients are your elderly children pregnant women liver failure um, because remember your liver is the organ that ends up generating albumin and also neonates so kids under less than three months and they've actually got a different range for phenytoin which is six to 15 milligram per liter now the next thing are the signs and symptoms of toxicity so there is actually an acronym which is snatched so s-n-a-t-c-h-e-d but without the t and without the e so first one s slurred speech then you've got N, which is nystagmus, which is basically a symptom that a patient might experience where you might see their eyes rolling continuously. The next one is ataxia for the A. Ataxia is basically a lack of voluntary coordination of muscle movement. So the patient doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily have any control over their muscle movements. Then the next one is C. C is for confusion. Then you've got your H. H is for hyperglycemia. So their glucose levels might end up increasing causing them to be more inclined to having seizures and then the last one is diplopia and diplopia is to do with vision so the patient can have double vision or even blurred vision etc etc now moving on to specific things about phenytoin 
Phenytoin is actually part of category one in regards to deciding whether you want to keep a patient on a specific brand. So you've got three categories. I'm not going to go into them as much just because we're speaking about phenytoin, but phenytoin is part of category one and category one also consists of your phenobarbitone, your primidone and your carbamazepine. So category one, with these specific medications, you either need to make sure that the patient is and remains on the same brand name or the same generic name plus manufacturer. Now, in regards to switching between products, phenytoin base is not the same as phenytoin sodium. Now, the equivalence between them two is actually 100 milligrams of phenytoin sodium is equivalent to 92 milligrams of phenytoin base. Capsules and the injections are formulated with phenytoin sodium and the suspension is formulated with phenytoin base. So therefore, meaning that if you're going to switch between the different formulations, you need to consider the difference between the sodium and the base because their bioavailabilities are very different. Now moving on to the side effects. So the first set of side effects you guys need to be aware of are the changes in appearance that phenytoin can have on a patient. So the first thing in that category is actually to do with an increase in hair growth. The next one is to do with gum hypertrophy. So basically um, an increase in growth in the gums. And the last one is coarsening of facial features. So someone might actually start to develop acne. Now, the second one is to do with blood dyscrasias. So as we said, phenytoin is an antifolate. It can affect what happens to your white blood cells, red blood cells, etc., etc. That means that when we first initiate someone on phenytoin, we need to be able to be aware of any signs of blood dyscrasias, meaning if they end up developing a sore throat, fever, mouth ulcers, unexplained bruising, bleeding, rashes. And if they end up developing that, we need to start looking into their white cell counts, specifically, actually, preferably full blood count. A patient can actually end up developing something called leukopenia. This is very severe. If this happens, we need to start withdrawing phenytoin. Also, when we do the full blood count for phenytoin, we want to look at your red blood cells because, as we said, it can cause something called megoblastic anemia because it's an antifolate. Now, another side effect to be wary of, specifically when initiating phenytoin and specifically within the first one to eight weeks of a patient starting it is something called anti-epileptic hypersensitivity syndrome. This isn't actually necessarily for all anti-epileptic anti medications. It's for specific ones. And phenytoin is actually one of them. When someone first takes phenytoin, they might generate specific symptoms um, which are classed in the anti-epileptic hypersensitivity syndrome class. I hope that makes sense. Um, so the symptoms are fever, jaundice, oral ulceration, lymphadopathy, I think I pronounced that correctly, which is basically swollen lymph nodes. And also you might end up developing renal, hepatic, pulmonary, hematological abnormalities, as well as even vasculitis, which is basically inflammation in uh, blood vessels. Basically, just to summarise, if they've been initiated on it, preferably within the first eight weeks, we just need to be wary of those symptoms that might develop. And the next thing is the rashes. So in the BNF, if you flip through the BNF, and I wish I had it on me right now, and I don't, there's there's a section in phenytoin which refers to pre-treatment screening. So there are actually specific categories of patients. I am referring to Han Chinese and Thai patients whom we will want to pre-screen before starting phenytoin to see if they actually have a specific allele, which is the HLA B asterisk 1502 allele. Uh, you don't need to know off by heart. It's just, it's in the BNF, so you'll know what you're trying to find. This basically means if during the pre-treatment screening, the results come back and that specific Han Chinese or Thai patient has that allele, that means they are more inclined to developing 
a rash, specifically Steven Johnson syndrome. If that ends up being found out, then that might actually affect whether they want to start the phenytoin or if they want to start it on a lower dose and if more monitoring needs to be involved, etc, etc. Now, the next thing is to do with low vitamin D levels. Now, phenytoin is actually an enzyme inducer. Enzyme inducers specifically in regards to anti-epileptics, they actually accelerate the metabolism of vitamin D, meaning a patient's vitamin D calcium levels will be reduced in their body, meaning with these sorts of patients, we actually need to consider vitamin D supplements. The results of having vitamin D deficiency can lead to someone having an increased risk of osteoporosis or even osteomalacia or rickets osteomalacia being basically the softening of uh, your bones and ricket is to do with bone development specifically in children now the initiation of vitamin d supplements is actually specifically for certain categories so this might be patients who have been immobilized for long periods of time patients who have had an, an inadequate amount of sun exposure or even patients who have a lack of calcium intake in their diet so these are the specific groups of people that we would want to initiate vitamin d supplements in their diet and the next thing to be aware of is hepatotoxicity. So phenytoin is hepatotoxic. You guys probably know the symptoms of hepatotoxicity now off by heart. We'll quickly go through them. You've got your abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, jaundice, um, pale stools, dark urine, itching, etc, etc. And the next thing is suicidal thoughts. So it's an, I believe it's an MHR alert in the BNF, which actually talks about when first initiating an anti-epileptic medication, and this goes for all anti-epileptic medications, there is a small increased risk of a patient developing a low mood, suicidal thoughts and ideation. So that is something that we need to consider as well when we're first initiating someone on not just only phenytoin, but other anti-epileptic medications as well. Now we move on to IV phenytoin. So IV phenytoin, the biggest things that you guys need to be aware of is to do with the side effects that you need to monitor, specifically bradycardia and hypotension. So when someone's specifically on phenytoin, we need to monitor their ECG and their blood pressure. If someone ends up developing bradycardia and hypotension, that means we need to reduce the rate of administration. In conjunction to this, we've also got something called phosphenytoin. And phosphenytoin is basically a prodrug of phenytoin. And it has a few more perks to phenytoin. So if we were to compare phosphenytoin and phenytoin, phosphenytoin can only be given um, via IV or intramuscularly. When you're giving it IV, you can actually give it at a faster, more rapid rate of administration in comparison to giving phenytoin IV. In conjunction to this, phosphenytoin has less injection site reaction. However, what we need to be wary of when or if we're going to be administering IV phosphenytoin is that it can develop severe cardiovascular reactions. So of course, you've got your bradycardia, your hypotension, but someone can actually end up going into cardiac arrest or have heart block or um, their heart just might stop beating so we need to consider this because they are very severe cardiovascular reactions so you guys just need to be wary of that as well and then last but not least is the conversion between phosphenytoin and phenytoin sodium you guys need to make sure that you know this preferably off by heart because in the exam they might want you they might give you a scenario where they're saying that the patient wants to be moved from phosphenytoin to phenytoin or something along those lines so you guys need to make sure that you know the differences so 1.5 mg grams of phosphenytoin is equivalent to one milligram of phenytoin sodium and there you go that's basically the majority of what you guys need to know about phenytoin and as usual i hope that i've covered most of it please 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 if you guys have any questions just leave a comment down below make sure you like subscribe and please share with anyone that you know that might benefit from this video as I've said before, guys, please stay motivated and I'll be seeing you guys real soon. Take care.